Hello everyone, welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is Rachel Pether and I'm a senior advisor to Skybridge, typically based in Abu Dhabi. I'm also the MC for SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a series of digital interviews that we launched during the work from home period. And what we're really endeavoring to do with the SALT Talk series is replicate the type of experience from our SALT conferences, where we provide a window into the mind of leading investors, creators, and thinkers, as well as providing a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. We obviously want to hear from you, our audience. So if you have any questions, please do just enter in the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom screen. And today's guest, we are very excited to welcome Mark Stolson to SALT Talks. Mark is the Chief Executive Officer and a partner of Legatum, a global investment firm based in Dubai, with a mission to generate and allocate capital to help people prosper. Over the last 16 years, Mark and his partners have worked together to build a world-class investment fund, while pioneering a number of high-impact philanthropic endeavors, which I'm sure we'll hear more about later today. These include the N Fund, the Freedom Fund, Luminos, the Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship at MIT, and the Legatum Institute Foundation in London. Prior to Legatum, Mark was a corporate finance and M&A attorney with Aiken Gump in Dallas, Texas, and also Moscow, Russia. He earned a BA in International Relations from Occidental College and a Master's in Law from Duke University. Mark, it is a real pleasure having you with us today. Rachel, great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. So I completely paraphrased your bio there, and I apologize for that. So maybe before we talk about Lagarden, tell me a bit about you and your personal background. Yeah, sure. Well, I actually thought you did a great job. That's just about it. Um, but just my personal background. So I grew up in just a, a great but fairly normal American middle class family in Phoenix, Arizona. And my, both my parents were sort of first generation college graduates. Uh, my dad served in the military um, and my mom was sort of a pioneering young CPA in the 1960s. And I think from the two of them, I, I got a lot of who I am today. So, you know, hard work, a focus on service, taking care of looking after your neighbors, um, and yeah, just the values that I have. And I think some of the values that Legatum has just came from where most of us get our values, from our family. Um, one of my partners has a great phrase that we've really adopted as kind of the firm motto, which is that life is not about what you get, life is about who you become. And I really think my parents infused that spirit and those values in me, and you can really see them expressed in what Legatum is all about today. I love that. And I guess that's a nice segue to Legatum itself. It's obviously quite a, a lofty name. What does the name actually stand for? Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so Legatum is Latin and it means legacy. Um, but it means it, the Latin word for legacy is actually a legal term and it means sort of a gift or a bequest to the next generation. So if you were writing up a will, a Legatum would be the gift. It would be I Legatum Rachel, my car. Or that the car would be the legatum, you would be the legatee, I would be the legator. So it means gift. And the idea that we sort of seized on was, we've got a limited amount of time on this planet. We want to do our best to make it better for the next generation. We feel like we stand on the shoulders of giants that came before us. We inherited a, a, you know, a bunch of wonderful things. What can we do to make it better for others? So that's what legatum means. And it's, it really drives a lot of who we are and, and what we try to do. And I know that you were, you know, previously in Moscow before. When was it that you made the, the move to Dubai? How did, how did you come about moving to the UAE? Well, I was, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a funny story, but I was sitting in my office. So I was a young lawyer working in an American firm in Moscow, doing corporate finance work, and a recruiter just called me out of the blue. I was sitting in my office, um, I don't know, it was probably a Saturday, and she said, look, I have this very off the wall opportunity, but it's in Dubai. So just stop me right now if that's completely off the table and if you have no interest moving to Dubai. This was 2004, maybe 2003, 2004. Um, 
And I was interested. I was just sort of immediately keen to know more, but I had no idea where Dubai was. So I remember holding the phone to my ear saying, absolutely, no problem with Dubai, tell me more. And I was Googling Dubai. Where exactly is Dubai? So that's how it all started. And that was 16 years ago. Um, and it has been an incredible adventure, one that I didn't expect. I came for a job, but I really wound up teaming up with some incredible partners and, a, and an amazing team that has a purpose and a sense of mission to not only build a world-class investment organization, but to use the capital that we generate, like you said, um, to express our mission, which is to help others prosper. I love that. And I remember doing the same when I was first had the opportunity, opportunity to move to Abu Dhabi. I mean, I couldn't even spell it at first. So when you were, you know, you were active in emerging markets as Legatum before many people were even venturing there, what drew you to the emerging markets initially? Mm. Yeah, I think some people, when they look at our history, they, they sort of instinctively think that we're an emerging markets fund or that's a focus of our business. And, and it is, but it really isn't. So something that makes Legatum quite distinctive is that we only manage our own capital. So it's all proprietary capital. And that gives us a huge competitive advantage in that we can take a very long-term perspective and we can invest in any sector, in any country, um, and really are sort of the masters of our own destiny. So that's, that's the, the core of what makes Legatum different. And because of that, we do, because we have long-term capital, we have a long-term perspective and we're looking for companies that can create long-term value. That's just a good fit for our capital. So historically, we've been looking for, you know, great secular growth stories in companies or companies that are innovating and disrupting, creating long-term value. It just so happened that for several decades, you could find those types of opportunities in the emerging markets. But we're not wedded to that. And today we would be looking for sort of a more nuanced view of emerging markets within global markets today. So you might find it in a in a, an emerging technology or maybe in a subset of some country that's really emerging and, and really beginning to innovate and create value. So we, we don't think of ourselves as emerging market in, in emerging markets investors, but we are looking for emerging trends and emerging opportunities. So what would be some example of those that you mentioned sort of within uh, emerging opportunities? What are some areas that you're currently looking at now? So currently, um, well, currently, so for us, the way that we look at opportunities is through sort of a very big lens, a very simple lens, actually that we call a simple big idea. So we sort of say that we, we stand on the moon and look back at planet Earth and say, where are the opportunities today? And so just trying to make it really simple. Where is their growth? And what kind of simple big idea can we express with a really great company? And just looking at a country like China, for example, so lots of people have different opinions and perspectives on China, but the reality is that it's expected that China's middle class will grow by another 300 million people over the next 10 years. It's expected that they'll add about $5 trillion worth of, of consumption over the next 10 years. So if you think about that for a second, that's like almost the entire population of the United States moving into the middle class in China. So we sit around thinking, well, what's that going to do? What are those middle class people going to want to do? Well, they're going to want to do what all middle class people want to do around the world. They're going to want to buy things and they're wanna, going to want to improve their lives. And so when we, when we ponder that and think, well, how can we express that in a company that's well run and that really has an amazing opportunity to grow and create value of the, over the long term, it would look like a company like Alibaba. So that's a very well-known story. But in our opinion, it may not be known as well as it could be or should be. We just feel like it's got a very long runway and has a lot more value that it can create. You know, for example, when you look at Alibaba, people think of it, I think, in shorthand as sort of a, an Amazon.com of China. And that's not totally unfair. It all, like, like Amazon, it has an AWS sort of cloud-based service. Amazon's is sort of worth, you know, recently when I checked $750 billion dollars, and that's the whole market cap of Alibaba. So that gives you just a sense of the growth potential of Alibaba as both sort of an online consumer platform and AWS and FinTech. Uh, it's just a great way to express this simple big idea that the Chinese consumer is rising and will do so for a long time. I mean, 300 million people coming to the middle class. As someone from New Zealand, that number, you know, just blows my mind. I mean, that's 100 times our entire right. population. <laughs> 
It's um, hard to wrap your head around. I mean, I'll give you one other example real quick. And that is, you know, when we look at a country like India, it's expected that by 2030, India may be or should be the third largest economy in the world. So, you know, what happens as an economy of that size grows and expands? Well, you're going to see changes in the capital markets and how businesses are financed. So one of our other investments today is in a company called the National Stock Exchange of India. It's the number one stock exchange in India. And as you see sort of bank financing beginning to sort of morph into capital markets financing for growing businesses, this company should be well positioned to be a leader. And, you know, it's got EBITDA margins of 78%. It's highly profitable, well run, number one in its, in its space and in a growing country. That's when we have long-term capital, we're looking for long-term value creation. It's those types of companies. And is that with related to uh, microfinancing or is that more uh, like SME corporate lending? So, so National Stock Exchange of India is, would be like, kind of like the New York Stock Exchange of India. It's, it's everything. It's, it's equity, it's credit, it's derivatives, and they are either number one or number two uh, in all of those spaces. So it's just well positioned to capture that entire market in India. Uh, but you mentioned microfinance, that's another great story. So that's, that's a great example of the type of thing that Legatum invests in. And many years ago, we were sort of captured by this simple big idea that there are 450 million unbanked people in India. So people that have no access at all to any banking services. Well, that's a problem, but that's also a huge opportunity. And you saw the emergence of sort of private sector microfinance companies getting out there into rural areas of India and offering sort of basic financial services. So we wanted to support that development, both from a philanthropic perspective, but also just because it's, you know, this has all the hallmarks of potentially a great business. And our first foray, our first major foray into microfinance was a disaster. It wound up being a complete zero. It was, you know, us sort of trying our hand at a, at a private company um, we were new to India as well. We got several things wrong and it was a total write-off. Um, but I think part of the way that Legatum is put together is we invest on the basis of our beliefs. We invest with a posture of hope um, and we learn and we try to apply what we try to apply what we learn, whether it's good or bad. And so in that case, you know, we took that sort of institutional knowledge that we had built up from what looked like a failure and applied it later. And, Several years later, we wound up helping recapitalize a company called SKS, which was the number one public and a publicly listed microfinance company. And, you know, that stock you know, went up 4x from our investment and we wound up making back all of our money and more. And it was a great end of the story. But the key sort of pivot point was a commitment to the space, but also a commitment just to applying what we've learned. That's fabulous. And I think I've heard you, you know, we've discussed before about how you invest on the basis of your beliefs, not your fears, which is obviously a, you know, excellent investment thesis. But I want to go a bit further into what you were talking about, you, these big ideas made simple. And I know that philanthrop uh, philanthropy is an area of importance well, for you personally and for the firm. Can you tell me more about some of the work that you've done here? Yeah, sure. So just going back to our, our mission statement, you said it very well, it is to generate and allocate the capital and ideas that can help others prosper. So to express that mission, we've got to do two things really well. First, we've got to generate capital. So we've got to run a world-class investment organization and we're super blessed to have a world-class team and, and a group of people that's been together for a long time. And when we stick to our knitting and operate within our core competencies, we can do that well. If we generate excess capital, how can we use it to help others prosper? And over the last 15 years, we've done that in a lot of different ways. And just like in our investment activities, we've learned a lot of things the hard way, but some things have really fired and have done really well. And so, you know, an example of, of a simple big idea is our work in global deworming. So one of my partners, Alan McCormick, it's sort of a, a story that's become lore at Legatum. He was reading an article in the FT it said that 1.5 billion people have intestinal worms and that the, the, far, the medicine is free or almost free. And you've just basically have a logistical sort of supply chain management problem, but that this is a solvable problem. It's cost 50 cents per person to treat them. So doing some quick math, we thought 
that's a solvable problem. That's the problem that could be solved in our lifetimes. Let's go for it. And that started us off on a, on a 10 year plus odyssey that started with Burundi and Rwanda. We allocated about $10 million, did a seven year project and saw the disease prevalence in those two countries come down radically. So these worms are, they're not just, they're not just small things. These are major neglected tropical diseases. They can kill you. They can make you lame. They can make you blind. Um, and they're only in sort of the, the, the poorest communities on the planet. And so we felt like we can make an outsized difference, an outsized return on investment in that space. They're called neglected tropical diseases because they're neglected. People don't think about them because in Western economies, people have, worms are not an issue anymore. You just don't find them in New Zealand or in, or in Switzerland or, or in the US. So, so we tackled that problem. And what I love about this story is not only did we see amazing success in that first sort of seven to 10 years in Rwanda and Burundi, but once we had the case study and the data that showed that it worked, we thought, well, we need to scale this. So how can we bring in more partners? And we took our name off of it and uh, worked with another, uh, just a small group of other co-founders. And we launched what's called the END Fund, Ending Neglected Diseases. And it started small, but today, uh, or as of today, it's issued you know, more than a billion dollars worth of medicine. It's treated over 900 million people. Um, and this year is amazing. In 2020, with all of the restrictions and lockdowns and challenges, we're on track to treat 100 million people in 2020. Wow. That's an incredibly um, impressive statistic. And I know that when we were uh, speaking uh, just earlier, we did notice that you do in fact have a, um, a sample of, of some of them behind you uh, in the bookshelf that have been very, very well traveled. Well, and I assured you that that wasn't put there as a prop. It actually does reside here in our library here at work. So we're 100% back in the office here in Dubai. And that jar of worms, it's, it's obviously, you know, not pretty, but it's very effective at helping people understand these things exist. And this is what it can look like inside of a child's belly. And this is that it can do a lot of damage. And so the CEO of the In Fund, Ellen Agler, was invited to be one of the only outside speakers at a Gates Foundation all staff um, meeting as she brought that jar of worms. And so we kind of for us, it's, it's very meaningful, it's well-traveled, but it reminds us that we're not just working on statistics or big numbers, but every life is supremely valuable and, and we wanna tackle these types of problems. Mm. And so when you, you know, a lot of people, it's almost like CSR and ESG are almost becoming catchphrases nowadays. And, you know, many companies have CSR manuals that sit um, gathering, gathering dust. When you look at companies to invest in, is the sort of impact piece or the, the CSR piece, is that important to you as an investor as well? So it's not important to us, and I'll tell you why. Um, it may be important to that company, and we don't sort of begrudge what those companies are trying to do or their motives. But from a Legatum perspective, given that our, our mission is to generate capital, and then for us to use that capital to express our mission to help others prosper, we want as much capital as possible returned to us so that we can control how that money is used to express our mission. We kind of feel like if the company keeps some of the shareholder returns that should be returned to us and they use it, then they're expressing a totally different mission. We, we would rather have the money and use it for things that we verified, that we trust, and that we have confidence in and that that's a better use of capital. And maybe we have a little differentiated, differentiated view, but you know, when we look at someone like Bill Gates, for example, or Microsoft, like well, I'm grateful to Bill Gates. We use his operating system. I, my, in my opinion, he's, he's you know, changed the world for the better. Like we all use this to communicate and to connect, to do business and work from home. And so we should be grateful to Bill Gates for Microsoft and these operating systems. If that's all he did, that would be super noble and just super admirable. But the fact that he then did that and then started the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and takes capital and does more good to me is not giving back. He shouldn't operate out of guilt or out of a sense of duty. That's like giving again. He's already given the world something great and he's giving the world something great again. And I, and I like that paradigm. And Legatum likes that paradigm too, where giving should, should be cheerful. 
Giving should be joyful, not out of a sense of guilt or some you know heavy sort of duty. Um, so that and that's kind of the spirit that we have at Legatum that we try to express with all of our partners in the field. That's that's fabulous, and I guess that sort of leads to another question. And when you're looking at your philanthropic vehicles, and I know you have a number of them, so I would like to talk about um, some of the others as well. How do you measure success? Success then, or is it? you don't sort of use these quali uh, quantitative metrics because that is separate from the investment uh, side of the business. How do you look at that in terms of success with the philanthropic vehicles? Yeah, well, it's difficult. I mean, it's a real challenge, but it's a challenge that we all, if you're going to give away money well and do no harm as sort of your first obligation, you have to, to be serious about measuring what it is that you're doing. I mean, Aristotle said that it's harder to give money away than make it. And we think that that's actually true because you're in the business of intervening in people's lives. And that's a, that's, that should be handled with great care. Um, and so I, I, I would answer in that we do our very, very best and, and we give it a lot of attention with something like the end fund and really across the board and all of our philanthropic activities, we're not asking the question of how much money is required or how much money have we given. That's a metric that the world, it's a crude metric and it's a metric that the world uses. Um, our question is much more of an investment mindset. What's the return on investment? You know, running Legatum as an investment organization, if I sat here and told you this is how much money we invested, you would say, well, that's great, but like, what were your returns like? It should be the same question in the philanthropic space. And so that's, the, that's kind of the mindset with which we approach everything that we do philanthropically. So with the in fund or the freedom fund or the other things that you mentioned, where we infuse into the organizations and work with the leadership and the board just to make sure that we establish baselines right at the very beginning of any project and understand where we're starting from and then do our best to track the progress so that we've got great numbers that have integrity and that can, that can give us good feedback mechanisms so we can make adjustments to get the highest return on investment. You mentioned the Freedom Fund again. We, we've actually already had quite a few questions coming in from the audience, which I do want to address. But before uh, I move on to those questions, tell me a bit more about the Freedom Fund and how that's one of the big ideas made simple. Okay. So the Freedom Fund, from a Legatum perspective, was doing two things at, at the outset. One was Legatum had a long history, and really that predated even my arrival here, um, in fighting modern day slavery, human trafficking, modern day sla uh, and slavery um, all over the world, um, including in South America and Eastern Europe, um, Western, Af Western Africa. And so we looked at this issue and felt like, you know, the, you know, the latest data coming out of the US and some of the and government agencies is that you've got 30 to 40 million slaves in the world. And given the ethos of legatum and the primacy that we place just on freedom, just on the, the sanctity of the individual and freedom, we felt like that's just a scourge and an evil that has got to be addressed. And the manner in which we're going to address it is to be targeted and focused and take that long-term approach. So what we did with the Freedom Fund was took a page out of our playbook from the End Fund and said, how can we collaborate with other philanthropists and pool our capital and pool our resources and our experience and really make a serious push here. So we joined forces with an organization called Walk Free and another one called Humanity United. And together with Legatum, the three of us launched the Freedom Fund. And the goal of the Freedom Fund is to work with frontline organizations. So instead of sort of a top-down approach of saying, we know how to deal with issues of slavery, we're coming alongside in partnership and supporting those who are already doing it on the front lines, in their communities, who speak the language, who understand the culture, and who have a passion for this work. And instead of scattergunning around the world and lots of small projects, we focused all of our efforts really in sort of the, the South Asian corridor where you see a high prevalence of slavery and trafficking. It felt like, let's, let's, make, let's make a big dent there um, and so that's what we've done. And the Freedom Fund has been directly involved in liberating nearly 30,000 people from slavery and their education programs and rehabilitation and, um, and, and awareness programs have touched oh, nearly 700,000 people. So, and we feel like we're just getting going. That's, that's something that we won't stop doing until 
we're gone uh, or until that ends. And so we've, we have amazing partners in Humanity United and Walk Free um, that are in it for the long term as well. Mm. And so how do you d define slavery, modern day so, slavery? Yeah, I mean, it, I think there are probably different definitions out there, but uh, our definition is people who have lost their freedom and are being exploited for profit. So, you know, again, there are different opinions, but when we look at it on a very fundamental basis, on a simple basis, anyone who's been deprived of their sort of freedom of movement um, and their ability to express their individual life as they see fit can fall into that category. But very specifically, when you see people in, you know, forced labor or child, child labor or people, you know, the issue of brothels um, in, in in some countries, um, these are these are you don't need a definition and you don't need a PhD. You know it's slavery. You know it's bondage. You know it's wrong, and so that's what we're that's what we're going after. Thank you so much. We've we have a question. Well, we've had a number of questions coming in from the audience, and I would just uh, like to address some of them. We've had one from David Wagner, and thank you for your question, David. He said, Mark Legatum does fantastic work. The Prosperity Index is always a must read each year. What criteria do you use to decide how to allocate capital? Okay, um, great question. Well, can I, if I can, I, I'd love to, first of all, say thank you, Dave, for the question. And yeah, the Prosperity Index has turned out to be a very, very powerful tool. The story there is, you know, if Legatum's mission is to promote prosperity and to help others prosper, we want to understand what that even means. And so many years ago, we worked with some amazing minds at Oxford University to kind of deconstruct the meaning of prosperity. A lot of people think that means money or just material wealth. And the, the meaning of that word is just much more complex and nuanced. It means your health and it means the, the, the quality of your, your relationships and your feeling of opportunity. It's just a very sort of multifaceted term. And so part of what we wanted to do is help people understand prosperity is good because it means, certainly it means wealth, it means growth, but it means a holistic sense of well-being as well. It, may, it means like kind of all the reasons that life is worth living. So that's prosperity. So then we thought, well, if we can define it, how can we measure it? The Prosperity Index is now run by a team in, in London at the, at the Legatum Institute who are super brainy and they use regression analyses and super technical stuff that's way over my head. But they have 82 different variables. They, they run this slide rule over every country on the planet and they are beginning to help policymakers understand what drives prosperity and what restrains prosperity. And this to us is a, is a gift. It's a tool to hopefully to policymakers and decision makers if they're interested in creating more prosperity in their countries, this should be a tool that serves those interests. Now that's the prosperity index. The other part of David's question was, you know, what's our investment criteria? And, you know, our investment criteria, just coming back to the beginning of this conversation, is just really simple. We look for those simple big ideas. We look for secular growth stories. When we find things that sort of match up um, and we find a great opportunity we then allocate a significant amount of capital behind our high conviction ideas. So we go narrow and deep. Um, we feel like the way to multiply our capital is not being right 100% of the time. It's being right a few times, but really backing those high conviction ideas with everything we've got. So as a consequence, we tend to run a very concentrated portfolio, um, sometimes as few as a handful of names, three names, five names, usually never more than 10. And to us, that's the way that we manage risk is rather than diversifying with 50 or 100 names, um, we just want to have a handful of names that we know extremely well and have high conviction behind. And that's how we invest. And that's all great. We have the ability with long term proprietary capital to hold through volatility. But our team is amazing. And they've also got the courage and boldness to pull the trigger um, when opportunities present themselves like we've seen even in, in March of this year. Definitely. And I think that um, we actually, we've actually had another question come in, which relates almost, you know, follows on from what you've just said about these concentrated and, and contrarian bets. So it's uh, Agsa Alam. And he said the Chandlers, founders of Legatum, are well known for taking these super concentrated and contrarian bets that sometimes took a long time to play out and had volatility along the way. 
The question is, would Legatum be able to run its strategy the same way if the firm managed outside capital? It's mm, a great question. Well, I mean, in terms of our history, so Legatum was really launched independently in 2006 um, with four partners. So we have, you know, Christopher Chandler, um, Alan McCormick, Philip Vasily, and myself. And today it's a partnership of equals. Uh, it's a partnership that's tied together. We're not related by blood. Um, we just worked together for 15, 16 years. But what unites us, and actually what unites everyone at Legatum, is this sense of mission and the purpose for why we're here. And so we kind of feel extremely lucky to have this job because we get to work in a great investment firm, but we get to use the capital for things that, that matter. Um, it's a great question about whether or not we'd be able to execute on, on Legatum strategy, which is long-term, um, unlevered, and just sort of looking for really high quality names and letting them compound value over time. It would be really difficult to do this with outside capital. You know, if we had limited partners calling and wanting their money back, you know, every time the market has a hiccup, that would hugely complicate our investment uh, approach. And so in March of this year, for example, we were carrying a very significant amount of cash coming into this year, had absolutely no idea what was on the horizon like the rest of the world. And, you know, with a concentrated portfolio, we saw names in which we have huge conviction, we know very, very well, really take a hit um, just from sentiment and the market reacting. And so in those moments of time, we can definitely hold or we can back our beliefs and invest on the basis of our beliefs and not our fears. And that's what we did. And so I'm extremely proud of our team because we basically went fully invested in March and that's worked out well so far. But our time horizon is not just trying to get to the end of this year. It's we're looking at three years and five years and 10 years and building a legacy, a legatum for the next generation. You know, what's always impressed me about the, the story of the, the founding partners at Legatum is while you have a very similar or you share the same investment thesis, you also share very much the same values. You know, I don't think you'd be able to do all the work that you do on the philanthropic side if you didn't really truly believe in, in the mission statement. So how do you, and sorry, I shouldn't say statement, in, in your mission, how, sort of how did it work with all of you coming together and was it always so aligned at the very outset? It was aligned at the very outset. And, and how, how does that happen? I'm not sure, but when it does, it, you know, don't miss it. Uh, would be my advice, you know, grab a hold of it with both hands. And I think, you know, I have two uh, grown sons who are, you know, just in, in university. And part of my advice to them is, in a lot of ways, life is less about what you do. It's more about who you do it with. And that's definitely been my experience. And so I look around today and feel like the, you know, the, the, the thing that means, the things that mean the most to me are my relationships. And within the Legatum context, that really starts with my partners. And, you know, we started as colleagues, but we became friends and we became partners and, and more. And so we're connected within our families as godparents. And we've been to funerals and weddings and graduations and everything else. We're doing life together. But it's not limited to just these four partners and owners of the firm. It's, it's open and available. And we want it for everyone that works at Legatum that comes in contact with Legatum because to us relationships are a core part of a prosperous life and so I think we we recognize that in each other I talked about my parents at the beginning and those that that sense that life is about who you become it's not about what you get they I don't know how they got that programmed into me but I just knew it and when I came into contact with other people with whom that resonated we were like we can do something great and we and we did we sat down with a blank sheet of paper we were blessed with, we had, we had capital, but we said, what kind of business do we want to create? And it was, it kind of generated one of those, you know, one of those deathbed conversations with yourself where you're like, it went on my deathbed. And I look back, what do I want my life to have been about? It's pretty short. You should, you know, stay awake for it. And we all were of the same mind that let's do something special. Let's, let's try to make the best use of our time in this capital um, and just and be excellent at what we do. And so, uh, you know, the Legatum story so far is an attempt to, to fulfill that, that belief or that mission. And it's had lots of fits and starts. It's had lots of 
failures and challenges along the way. We've had a few successes and we're all still together, which to me is probably the number one success. That's definitely a very good sign. It was interesting when you were talking about the prosperity index and the sort of things you look for with regards to prosperity. You know, I feel that in this modern world, we're so hungry to chase down success that actually we become like, you know, miserable people or, or people with, with bad values. And so it's really about how you define, you know, prosperity to you rather than just, as you say, you know, financial success or, or monetary gain. Yeah, well, I think that's right. I mean, when I look back over the Legatum experience, I, I kind of feel like a big takeaway is that, you know, no, no one here like came for money. So we didn't like ever, this is a bootstrap first generation um, environment here. And so it's kind of like, if it's going to be, it's, it's up to me, you know, atmosphere. And yet, you know, looking at, at, at what we've done together, I feel like therefore there's nothing special. We're not, we're not PhDs in development economics. We're just normal people that came together around an idea, agreed that we were going to try to execute on this together. And then we just never gave up. You know, we just, uh, maybe we're just very stubborn, but I, I, I kind of feel like that formula is available to everyone. Find something that you believe in, find people you want to do it with, don't give up, and you might be surprised what happens in sort of 10, 15, 20 years. I would like to have sort of, well, give you the, the final word, Mark. What is one thing that is sort of exciting you about the next 12 months in terms of investing with Legatum? Hmm. Well, I mean, one of the things that we try to focus on is, again, like I said, that concentrated, concentrated portfolio with high conviction ideas. So ideally, we'll be doing very little over the next year in terms of our investing. No, that's, that's you know, a bit of a joke because we're constantly working. We're constantly scanning the globe, looking for new opportunities. We're keen and eager learners. So we're constantly trying to learn about new disruptive technologies. You know, you would find us sort of investing in in companies that, that fit with our profile and our strategy, you know, whether it's in financial services or in, or in tech or in consumer. But you would probably find us trying to learn about crypto and about FinTech and about DeFi and you know, what are emerging markets within the, the broader market of global finance. Um, and so those are some of the themes that we would be excited about and looking at over the next year. But really, Legatum doesn't really even think in terms of the next year. We think in terms of the next 10 years. And what I'm excited about is working with my incredible colleagues here at Legatum to see Legatum multiply our capital, multiply our impact, and multiply our influence uh, and do it together over the next 10 years. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been uh, a joy to speak with you as it always is. And I think you really do make you know, this amazing case or great example of values-based investing and the true impact that you're having. So thank you so much for, uh, for giving up your precious time today to speak with us. And I hope that we can continue the conversation at some point in the future as well. Rachel, a real pleasure. Thanks so much.